I just want to take a quick break from the video to bring you a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN is giving all currently listed viewers a special deal of 77% off a three-year plan. Just go to nordvpn.com slash criminally listed or use the promo code criminally listed at the checkout. Internet security may not be something you think about every day. I certainly didn't. Then about a year and a half ago, while I was writing for another channel, I wrote a script about the conspiracy theory that interdimensional humanoid reptiles are controlling society. After the video was posted, I started getting strange emails and Facebook messages claiming to be from humanoid reptiles, and they said they were watching me. While I'm sure it was just a prank, it made me seriously consider protecting myself while I'm online. I did some research, and I came across a great article in PC Magazine that talks about VPNs, and how they are an excellent and very inexpensive way to protect yourself while online. PC Magazine has only given one VPN a 5 star review, and that's NordVPN. I've been using NordVPN ever since I read the article, and it's awesome. They have over 4,000 servers in 61 countries, and the servers are super fast. For about the price of a cup of coffee every month, you can start protecting yourself today with NordVPN. Just go to nordvpn.com slash listed, or use the promo code criminally listed at the checkout to save 77% on a three-year contract. Number three, Jill Cahill. In the summer of 1986, Jill Russell was 29 years old and she worked as an airline stewardess. One night, she went out to a bar with friends in Syracuse, New York. At the bar, through mutual friends, she met Jeff Cahill a 26-year-old stockbroker at Merrill Lynch. The initial meeting led to them dating. Not long after they started dating, Jeff quit his job and he got into construction. He ended up starting his own construction business and he and Jill moved in together in a small home in Skinny Atlas, which is a town southwest of Syracuse. The next summer, Jill announced that she was pregnant a few months later, they had a small wedding. In February 1988, Jill gave birth to their first child, a son. This was followed by a daughter in July 1990. After the birth of their daughter, Jeff lost interest in going to work. Looking to save her family from financial ruin, Jill and two friends started a garden renovation business. But the more successful Jill became, the more Jeff resented her, and he would do things to undermine her. Also, he wasn't paying the household bills, and he was hiding the notices demanding the money. This resulted in their services being turned off on a regular basis. In 1996, Jeff was arrested for bouncing some checks. This caused the already fractured marriage to split even more. In the summer of 1997, Jill met another man who lived out of state, and they started a long distance romance. By Halloween 1997, Jeff and Jill were still together, and they had been invited to a Halloween party. Jeff came up with what he thought was a clever Halloween costume. He dressed up as O.J. Simpson, and he wanted Jill to be Nicole Brown Simpson. Jill flat out refused. In the spring of 1998, Jill discovered that Jeff had hidden a voice-activated microphone attached to a tape recorder in their home. They got into an argument, and Jeff pushed her to the floor. He also twisted her arm behind her back. Jill was able to free herself, and she grabbed a knife. She was able to get out of the house without being too badly injured. She then demanded a separation. Jeff agreed to separate, and they signed a settlement of separation. The problem was that since they were so deeply in debt, neither of them could afford to move out of the house. So they continued to live together. Weeks later, on April 21st, 1998, at around 5.30 a.m., a call came in to 911. A police officer went to the Cahill's home and he found five people on the front porch. They were Jeff Cahill, his parents, his brother, and a doctor that was a family friend. Jeff told the officer that Jill was in the kitchen. 
The officer walked into the house, and he found the kitchen covered in blood. Blood was literally dripping from the walls and the ceiling. Jill was lying on the floor, and she was partially wrapped in blankets. She was barely alive. She was convulsing and moaning. The officer was surprised that she was alive, so he called the paramedics. It was clear she had suffered a vicious assault. Her hair was matted with blood. The officer couldn't tell what color her hair was because of how much blood was in her hair. Her left temple had very clearly been caved in. Near the body, the police found a blood-covered aluminum bat that was dented. Jeff told the officer that their two children, who were 10 and 7, were upstairs in a bedroom. The officer found both children. They were unharmed, but terrified. Jeff had also been injured. He had minor cuts on his hands and his arms. He was taken to a different hospital than his wife. He had to get a few stitches. In addition to having part of her skull caved in, both of Jill's arms were broken, her cheekbones were broken, and her skull had multiple fractures. Amazingly, she didn't die. For her to survive, the doctors were forced to put her into an artificial coma and remove part of her brain and her skull. After getting stitched up, Jeff was taken to the police station. He said that he and Jill got into an argument. He claimed she picked up a knife and attacked him. He simply used the bat to defend himself. However, the evidence didn't back up Jeff's version of events. Their children also saw and heard something much different. There was a fight, but Jill was unarmed. She was first struck with a bat in the mudroom, possibly while running to the back patio. She made it to the patio, but she was hit again and then dragged back into the mudroom. She was hit again in the mudroom, then she either made her way or she was dragged into the kitchen. As she laid helpless on the floor, he stood over her and hit her several more times with the bat. As she was being attacked, she screamed for her children to get help because their father was killing her. The eldest daughter came down during the attack and Jeff told her to go back upstairs. After beating Jill within inches of her life with an aluminum baseball bat, Jeff decided to take his own life. He got a hose and he put one end in the tailpipe of his car. He then put the other end of the hose through a crack in the window of his car and then he got into the car. He planned to drift off peacefully into death, but then he had second thoughts and decided against suicide. He got out of the car and he made a phone call. It wasn't to 911. Instead, he called his parents. His parents, along with his brother and a doctor who was a family friend, arrived at the family's home a short time later. It was only then that they called 911. Jeff was arrested, and the day after he savagely beat the mother of his children with an aluminum baseball bat, he was released on a $100,000 bail, which was posted by his family. A month later, Jill was still alive. Jeff was charged with several crimes, including aggravated assault, disfigurement, and depraved indifference to human life. But he remained free on bail. In the six months after the attack, Jill underwent 15 surgeries and survived many potentially lethal infections and several bouts of meningitis. At times, she was in agonizing pain. But she had also made some remarkable progress considering her skull had been cracked open and caved in. When she came out of her coma, she remembered her children's names. After six months, she was able to talk in very short sentences she was able to move her left leg and her left arm, and she was able to do things like wash her face. Her family was planning to move her to a rehabilitation center. At about 10 p.m. on October 27, 1998, about six months after the attack, several nurses working on Jill's floor 
noticed a strange man wearing a wig and glasses. He was carrying a mop, and he was dressed like a custodian, but he wasn't dressed like the other custodians at the hospital. His uniform was slightly different colors. The nurses got a bad feeling, and they checked on Jill. When they turned on the lights, they saw that her face was blue, and there was white powder on her chin and neck. As they tried to save her, several of the nurses smelled bitter almonds. Jill fell back into a coma, and she was pronounced dead later that night. She had been poisoned with cyanide. Jeff, who was still out on bail, was arrested. It turned out that Jeff had been playing the murder for months. He bought his disguise and practiced wearing it around the hospital. The police searched Jeff's computer and they discovered that in the weeks leading up to the poisoning, he researched cyanide and its effects. He made his own letterhead impersonating a local business and then he used the letterhead to order some cyanide from a chemical company to be shipped overnight. The next day, Jeff went to the business and waited for the UPS driver. Jeff was able to convince the driver to let him have the package. He then snuck into Jill's hospital room, pried her mouth open, and dumped the poison into her mouth. In 1999, he was convicted of first degree murder and he was sentenced to death. Then in 2003, the New York Supreme Court overturned his death sentence. The New York Penal Code says that for a murder to be first degree murder, and it must be committed in the commission of a second crime. For example, this would be a rapist killing his victim, or a robber killing the person they're stealing from. Since Jeff didn't commit any other crimes while he poisoned his estranged wife, who was in the hospital because he beat her head in with an aluminum bat, the death sentence was quashed. His life sentence was then reduced, and he'll be eligible for parole in 2036. Number 2. Reggie Cole On March 27, 1994, the police were called to an apartment building in South Central Los Angeles. There had been a shooting. When detectives Marcelo Wynn and Peter Rosanskis arrived on the scene, there was a cold, dead body lying in the road. He was identified as 29-year-old Philippe Gonzalez Angeles. Earlier that night, Angelus and his two friends were out drinking. They came to the apartment building because on the second floor there was a brothel. Angelus wanted to see a prostitute named Melinda. When he knocked on the door of the brothel, he was told that Melinda was busy and he needed to leave. As Angelus and his friends were walking back to their car, people inside the brothel heard four gunshots, then the sound of screeching tires and that was followed by four more gunshots. People working at the brothel went outside and found Angelus and his two friends lying in the road. They had all been shot. His friends were rushed to the hospital and they survived, but Angelus did not. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The detectives interviewed the owner of the brothel, John Jones. He said that he saw the shooting. He said that three or four young black men, wearing trench coats and carrying silver revolvers, tried to rob Angelus and his friends. He said that one of the robbers was shot in the leg. Detectives Wynn and Rosanskis went around to local hospitals looking for a man who had been shot in the leg. A security guard at a hospital in South Central Los Angeles got in contact with the detectives and said he remembered a man with a bullet wound in his leg coming into the ER on the night of the shooting. However, the detectives found no records of a man with a bullet wound coming into the hospital that night. Less than a month after the shooting, Detective Wynn received an anonymous tip that a letter to 19-year-old Obi Anthony, who was a member of the Nine Deuce Hoover Crips. At the time, Anthony was in the LA County Jail because he had been arrested while driving a stolen car with another man. When he was arrested, Anthony said that a third man was involved in the carjacking, 19-year-old Reggie Cole. Cole was a fellow gang member who sold crack cocaine. 
The police arrested Cole in a hotel room, and he denied being involved in the carjacking. Detectives went in Rosanskis, brought Cole into an interviewing room, and Rosanskis searched him. He pulled up one of Cole's pant legs, and they saw a scar from a bullet wound. When in Rosanskis showed John Jones, the owner of the brothel who claimed to see the shooting, Anthony and Cole's pictures in a photo lineup. He picked out both men on his first try. He then picked them out of a live lineup. In the fall of 1994, both Obi Anthony and Reggie Cole went to trial. Both young men claimed they were innocent. They said that they were hung over the night of the shooting after attending a birthday party the night before. Also, there was absolutely no physical evidence that connected the men to the shooting. John Jones was the star witness for the prosecution, and he said he saw Cole and Anthony approach Angelus and his two friends on the street. They tried to rob them, and then ended up shooting them. Jones said that he was not receiving anything in exchange for his testimony. Anthony and Cole were found guilty, and they were sentenced to life in prison. Cole was sent to Calipatria State Prison in Imperial County to start serving his term. He eventually joined the prison gang, 49 Deuce Crips. In November 2000, about six years into his sentence, Cole upset one of the gang's shot callers. The shot caller was a hulking 200 pound man named Eddie Clark, who was better known by his nickname, The Devil. Clark was a violent inmate who had a history of sexually assaulting other inmates. Clark was 34 he had spent half of his life in prison. He was first convicted of murder when he was a juvenile. He had beat another teenager to death. He was released and then during a robbery he sexually assaulted a woman and shot her son. Cole's run-in with Clark started when Clark's cellmate was working in the prison yard. The cellmate was also a high-ranking member of the gang. A guard found a shiv and a glove on the ground beside him. Cole happened to be working in the yard when the shiv was found. So Clark ordered Cole to say that the shiv was his. Cole refused. Not long afterward, on November 28, 2000, Clark walked up behind Cole and stabbed him in the side with a sharpened piece of steel. Clark whispered in Cole's ear that he was now his bitch. Clark then walked away before any correctional officers saw what he did. Cole knew that Clark would probably repeatedly sexually assault him and then murder him. Seeing no other option, Cole dug up a shiv that was buried in the yard. It was six inches long and had been made from the pieces of a stapler. While Clark was being searched by a guard, Cole came up behind him and buried the shiv into his neck. He died a short time later, and Cole was again charged with murder. This time, he was facing the death penalty. When Cole met his public defender, Christopher Poulard, he told him that he shouldn't have been in prison because he had been wrongly convicted. He swore that Clark was the first person he killed, and he only did that for fear of his own life. Poulard decided to read the transcripts from Cole's trial and he noticed a few oddities. For the next three years, Poulard investigated the crime that put Cole behind bars, and he made some shocking revelations. The first was that Cole was identified because the star witness, John Jones, said that one of the shooters was shot in the leg, and Cole had a scar from a bullet wound on his leg. The problem was that Cole was shot six years before the shooting. Had he been shot a month before his leg was examined by the detective, the wound wouldn't have been that scarred over. Poulard also found a police report that was written a few days after the shooting. The report said that Cole had jumped off the handlebars of his friend's bike and ran from the police. Had he been shot in the leg days earlier, he wouldn't have been able to run. Poulard had the autopsy report reviewed, and the medical examiner determined that the shooting could not have happened the way that John Jones said it did. Notably, the bullets were fired from above, 
possibly by someone on the roof or the second floor of the building where Jones's brothel was located. It turned out that on the night of the murder, the detectives and a reporter who was trailing them for a book that he was writing went to the roof of the building. They found six shell casings that apparently looked old. The detectives didn't collect them as evidence. Instead, they gave the shell casings to the reporter who kept them. Markings on the casings matched a gun that was found in the brothel. Poulard then had an investigator interview Jones, who was incarcerated in a state prison. He admitted that he made the story up and he was coached by Detective Wynn. He said he never saw Cole or Anthony before. He was worried that the police might have thought that he was the one who did the shooting or they may have taken away his children. A few days after the shooting, Jones was arrested for pandering. At the time, Jones had a long criminal history, which including shooting an ex-girlfriend to death. Because of his criminal record, he was looking at 6 to 12 years in prison. It turned out that he had been given a deal for testifying against Cole and Anthony, and he was only sentenced to 5 days in probation. The fact that Jones was given a deal wasn't revealed at Cole and Anthony's trial. After hearing the evidence that Cole was wrongly convicted in the first place, the prosecutor who was trying Cole for the murder of Clark decided to offer Cole a plea deal. Cole took the deal and he pleaded guilty to manslaughter. He was given 10 years in addition to his life sentence. Since Cole killed another inmate, who was a shot caller nonetheless, he was moved to solitary confinement for the safety of the other inmates and for himself. Meanwhile, Poulard worked with the Innocence Project and they filed a habeas corpus. In April 2009, the courts vacated Cole's murder conviction and the charges were dismissed three months later. But Cole remained in prison for the manslaughter charge. Then Poulard successfully argued that Cole should be released for time served on the wrongful murder conviction. Cole was released from prison in May 2010 16 and a half years after he was originally sentenced to life for a murder that he did not commit. O.B. Anthony was released from prison in October 2011. Both men sued the city of Los Angeles and they ended up settling out of court. Anthony was awarded $8.3 million and Cole won $5.2 million. Reggie Cole never killed anyone until he was sent to prison for murder and then he and Anthony may still be in prison had he not killed the devil. Number 1. Arbornadis and Claire Hugh Torrey Pines State Park is a popular and picturesque beach in San Diego, California that attracts both locals and tourists from around the world. On August 12, 1978, 15-year-old Barbara Nadis, who lived in Long Beach, California, went to the beach with her boyfriend, 17-year-old James Ald, and some friends. Barbara and James slept on the beach while their friends slept in a nearby car. Early the next morning, James started pounding on the car. He badly needed help. While they were sleeping, he and Barbara had been attacked. James was rushed to the hospital with a severe head wound, but it was too late for Barbara. She had been beaten and strangled, and her mouth was full of wet sand. She also had been sexually assaulted. Finally, her right nipple had been severed with a knife. James survived the attack, but he had no memory of what happened. The police suspect that James was bludgeoned while he was sleeping. Unfortunately, the police didn't find any promising suspects, and the case went cold. Six years later, 14-year-old Claire Hugh, who lived in Rhode Island, was visiting her grandparents in San Diego. One of her friends came from Rhode Island with her. On the night of August 23, 1984, after her grandparents went to bed, Claire snuck out of her grandparents' home and went to the beach alone. At 5 a.m. the next morning, a beachcomber named Wallace Wheeler found her body. 
She was lying on her towel, which was soaked in blood. She had been beaten and strangled to death, and her mouth was full of sand. Her left breast had been removed with a knife. She may have been sexually assaulted, but during the autopsy, the medical examiner didn't find any traces of sperm. The police and the FBI were confident that one killer was responsible for both murders. Both girls were similar in age, Barbara was 15 and Claire was 14. They were both from out of town and they were attacked after sundown on the same beach. In fact, they were killed just a few hundred feet away from each other. Barbara was killed near Lifeguard Tower 7 and Claire was killed near Lifeguard Tower 5. They were both beaten, strangled, sand was stuffed into their mouths and their breasts were mutilated. Unlike Barbara's murder, the police had a suspect in Claire's murder. It was the man who found her body, Wallace Wheeler. Wheeler, who was 61, worked as an insurance salesman most of his life. When he found Claire's body, he was suffering from mental illness. Claire's parents flew from Rhode Island and they went to the beach. Wheeler saw them and he went up and introduced himself. When he did, he told them that he was a psychic. After they returned home to Rhode Island, Wheeler started sending them long letters. In one of his letters, he wrote that he foresaw finding the body. In another letter, he wrote that Claire's spirit appeared to him and they had an intense clairvoyant relationship. He thought that her spirit was trying to help him solve her murder. In one of his last letters, he said that he saw the killer and described him as having long hair, a high forehead, and he was missing one ear. In 1986, two years after Claire's murder, Wheeler tried to kill himself by driving his car over a cliff. Two years after his suicide attempt, he jumped to his death from the 13th story of his apartment building. Years later, the police cleared Wheeler as a suspect. In 2012, the San Diego Police Department started to re-examine the two murders. They found bloodstains on Claire's pants that weren't her blood. They also did an analysis on a vaginal swab taken at the time of the autopsy. In 1984, when the autopsy was done, no traces of semen were found, but this time, they did find semen. It turned out that the blood and semen were from two different men. The blood stains were from a man named Ronald Tatro. Tatro had a long criminal history and he served time for violent crimes including kidnapping and sexual assaults. The semen was from a man named Kevin Brown. He was a crime lab analyst with the San Diego Police Department. The detectives working on the case learned that Brown never worked on Claire's case, so they saw no reason why his semen would be found on the swab. They theorized that Brown and Tatro killed Claire together. Both Brown and Tatro were known to frequent strip clubs in San Diego, and the detectives thought that is where they met. However, the detectives couldn't find any evidence that the two men knew each other. When they discovered that the blood on the jeans belonged to Tatro, they were not able to interview him. He had drowned a year earlier in an apparent boating accident. Investigators thought it was very possible that Tatro's death was a suicide. Adding credence to the theory that Tatro killed himself is that he died on August 24, 2011, 27 years to the day that Claire's body was found. With Tatro dead, the detectives then focused their attention on Brown, who had retired from the crime lab in 2002. Brown had an unusual nickname around the crime lab. His co-workers called him Kinky. Some of his female co-workers felt uncomfortable working with him. One co-worker said that he showed her a disturbing porno movie at work, and another time, he read a criminal report aloud and laughed. The criminal report was about a vicious sexual assault. In January 2014, the police questioned Brown and the first thing that they asked him was if he knew Tatro. 
Brown said he had never heard of him, and he definitely didn't know him. The detectives then showed him a picture of Claire Hugh, and Brown said that he recognized her. They asked him if he was involved in her murder. Brown swore that he never killed anyone. The detectives didn't arrest him, but they did return the next day to ask him more questions. That's when Brown admitted that in the 1980s, he did meet a woman named Claire, who was visiting San Diego with a friend. He said he couldn't be sure, but he may have had sex with her. He was adamant that he didn't kill her. Brown asked to be given a polygraph test, and the detectives obliged him. The results were inconclusive, but two questions that Brown answered no to showed signs of deception. Those questions were, did he have sex with Claire Hugh, and did he kill Claire Hugh? Brown wasn't arrested, and he was allowed to leave the police station. The detectives continued to investigate his background. They learned that after the first time they interviewed Brown, he called one of his friends. Brown told his friend that he had done a photo shoot with Claire at the beach, and she ended up dying that night. Over the spring and the summer, the police built a case against Brown, and in October, they were planning to arrest him. But they never ended up arresting Brown. On October 20th, 2014, he hanged himself from a tree in a park, not far from a cabin that he owned with his wife. The detectives took his suicide as a sign of his guilt. Brown's friends and family, on the other hand, don't think that he was involved in the murder in any way. He had been incredibly depressed and anxious since finding out that he was a suspect. He was also terrified of going to prison. Brown's wife ended up suing the police department. Her lawsuit contends that the swab was contaminated and the police investigation drove her husband to suicide. The question then is, was it possible that Brown's semen or even some of his DNA accidentally ended up on the vaginal swab? Experts say, yes, it is possible. The original swab was taken in 1984 and rules and standards surrounding the collection of forensic evidence wasn't as strict then, so contaminations were known to happen. It's possible that Brown's DNA got on the swab and it wasn't his semen. It may have just been misidentified as a trace of semen and it could have been his saliva or skin cells. It's also quite possible that it was brown semen. To do tests, the lab analysts need baseline samples to make sure the tests are accurate. These baseline samples are usually purchased from a company. But in the 1980s, to save money, crime analysts with the San Diego Police Department use their own saliva and semen for baseline samples. So in the 1980s, when Claire was murdered, Brown's semen was in the lab. Experts also said that Brown's DNA could have easily been transferred to the swab. If his DNA was on the scissors used to cut a sample from Claire's vaginal swab, this would have caused Brown's DNA to be transferred to the swab. It's even possible that Brown had sex with Claire, left her alive, and then she was killed shortly afterward. Whether Kevin Brown was involved in the murder of Claire Hugh or if his DNA was accidentally transferred to the swab remains murky. However, based on Ronald Tacho's criminal history and the fact that his blood was found under clothes, he was most likely involved in Claire Hugh's murder. If that is the case, then that means someone else killed Barbara Natis because Tatro was in prison in Arkansas when she was killed. He never escaped from prison and he wasn't furloughed. He was paroled in 1982 and he moved to San Diego. Then two years later, Claire Hugh was killed. When Barbara was killed, Kevin Brown was in college in Sacramento, which is about 500 miles away from San Diego. However, the police confirmed that no DNA evidence connects Barbara's murder and Claire's murder. A criminalist said that Claire's murder could have been a copycat of Barbara's murder, or it simply was a coincidence that they were so similar. As for who killed Barbara Natis, 
That is a mystery that our family hopes will be solved one day soon. Thanks a lot for watching. Hopefully you found that interesting. If you did, please subscribe for more videos just like it. Don't forget to go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merchandise, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.